to it fairly and I am a chocoholic and I'm also co-founder with my husband Craig uh, Craig Sams of Green and Blacks and um, we dared to launch a challenger chocolate brand which has gone on to become nearly 100 million pound a year brand and I think has really helped to shape the concept of ethical business as we know it today even though we didn't realize that's what we were doing at the time um, we had really strong values woven into the DNA of Green and Blacks from day one. And um, thank you for St. James's, uh, to St. James's Place for inviting me to take part. Um, I am always love talking about values in business because that is something that's incredibly close to my heart. And um, if I just get your juices going, guys, um, I have a stack of 10 bars of Green and Blacks about my person. And we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, which I really enjoy. Um, and the person who comes up with the best question, as judged by Diane, uh, will receive this stack of 10 bars. So just something to get you thinking as we're going along. Um, I'm just going to share my screen next. So if you give me one, one second. Um, Marvellous. So, you know, when people ask me where I got my values from, um, I always say to them that it was actually from watching Blue Peter twice a week as a child. And what that TV programme in those days um, really made me think about was how important it was to be kind to other people, uh, just to take other people into account when we did things. Um, and, to, and just really to think about people who are less fortunate than ourselves. And then um, I actually came to chocolate as a chocolate lover, not just with the strong set of um, Blue Peter values about my person, but also when I was about 13, a friend gave me a copy of a book called A Shopper's Guide to Saving the Planet. And there was precisely zero that I could do in Bromley in those days to save the planet, except get my mother to drive a lot of gin bottles to the bottle bank. And um, I took a bit of direct action. Um, I thought I would put some bricks in the loo uh, cisterns at school to save water. Only unfortunately got busted standing on a lavatory seat and sent to the headmistress's office. And I have to say that um, my green leanings kind of went into dormancy at that point. But um, in 1991, I married an incredibly green man. Uh, Craig Sams is the greenest man I've ever met and he was founder of a company called Whole Earth Foods, creators of my favourite peanut butter um, and also chairman of the Soil Association and one day earlier that year I walked into his office and I found um, two squares of a sample bar of green and blacks, what became green and blacks, sitting on his desk. It was it was just a, a unmarked sample bar and I obviously you find chocolate on your fiance's desk and there is only one thing to do so I popped it in my mouth and oh my god this taste explosion went off and I and I realized that this was the darkest yummiest naughtiest most amazing chocolate I'd ever had so I said to Craig what is it and he told me it was a sample of the world's first organic chocolate and I said well what are you going to do with it and he explained that he couldn't do anything with it because it had sugar in and he'd founded the whole whole earth empire on the idea of no added sugar he'd managed to demonize sugar actually um but the memory of the chocolate nagged at me and i nagged at craig and eventually he turned around and said look if you're so interested you do it and what he really meant by that was um he could take care of some of the sales functions and distribution etc but i had to do the pr and marketing i was a journalist at that point um, and uh, the really big catch was that I had to finance it because he didn't have launching a whole new brand in his budget. And this was one of those crossroads in life. I mean, this was a defining moment where um, I actually, I was a journalist. I was used to writing about other people doing exciting things. I never imagined that I would have something exciting to do myself. And I remembered a postcard that I'd bought in Carnaby Street when I was about 15 of a man on a diving board and it said if you don't do it you'll never know what would have happened if you had done it. 
So basically I went to the edge of the diving board, I dived off and I've never ever regretted it. And my personal inspiration, my absolute hero was the amazing Anita Roddick. I'd gotten to know Anita through my journalism and actually we'd become friends. And I was incredibly admiring of the way that Anita had shown that you could actually do good through doing business. So I had this idea, and it's a bit of a cliche now, but uh, I had the idea that I could maybe change the world one square of chocolate at a time. Um, but first I had to find the money. And happily, this coincided with the only time in my life when I'd actually had a chunk of money in the bank. I'd sold my flat before I moved in with Craig and I'd banked the equity. And I had £20,034 sitting in the bank. And two tonnes of dark chocolate at the minimum order were going to cost 20,000 quid, which didn't even leave me with enough for a pair of shoes in those days. Um, and I had to uh, call my bank manager to get him to transfer the money. And I still don't understand why, but weirdly, they want to know what you're spending your own money on. So I had the satisfaction of turning around to my bank manager when he asked that question and saying, chocolate. Um, and then we had to create the brand. And um, believe it or not, this, this global brand began on a rainy Saturday night in our home in the Portobello Road. Uh, I think we had a yellow legal pad and a biro. And we threw around all sorts of names. Um, and I can safely say, that SJP would not have invited me here this morning if we'd gone with Summer Craigs. Um, they were things like eco chalk and bio chalk and organic chalk. So I said, no, 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 no. What we need is something that sounds like it, it's an established British confectionery company. So you have, you know, brands like Callard and Bowser and Barker and Dobson and Charbonnella Walker and obviously Fortnum and Mason, what they've all got in common is an ampersand. So basically we were green because we were organic. We were black because we had the darkest chocolate on the market at the time by far. And I whacked an ampersand between those two words. And honestly, the minute I said it, I knew we had it. It just pushed all the right buttons. Um, and I have to say that that took all of 10 minutes and we scampered downstairs and came up with the rough design for this on Craig's uh, archaic well, it wasn't archaic then it was state of the art apple and um that took about another 10 so it does completely blow me away that you know this is now a global brand um worth approaching 100 million quid um but how do we get here from you know from that bedroom well i think that we got certain things right and i think they're things that every business has to get right they're not rocket science um but it's it, it's it's the key factors from, from my point of view are branding and design, um, PR, marketing, um, customer service, which I ran for nine years. And then very importantly for us, um, the, the ethics which underpin our brand. But this all comes from believing in your product. And, you know, to me, that's the most important thing you know with chocolate obviously it's a sexy bit but doesn't matter what your business is what your service is when you absolutely believe that it is the best out there it makes everything else so easy it just flows from there it makes it easy to sell to an end customer in my case a supermarket buyer and then ultimately really importantly to the kind of talent that you want to grow your team as your business grows and I guess you know, the real advantage that I brought to Green and Blacks was my experience as a journalist. So I flipped it around and I wrote what I hoped was a catchy press release. Um, and it had a title, um, guilt free chocolate, question mark, well, almost. And I sent it out to literally everybody I could think of. Um, it was whether they were, you know, magazine editors, newspaper editors, beauty editors, um, because of all the antioxidants, chefs, restaurateurs. If I'd eaten in your restaurant, you got a bar of green and blacks with a press release attached to it. And actually the fact that I accompanied every single press release with copious quantities of green and blacks, I think is the real secret of how we ended up with a telephone directory's worth 
of press cutting because it is a very good way to get your product noticed on someone's desk and um, it actually became kind of central to our whole philosophy which was that tasting is believing and we we poured a huge amount of money and effort over the years into sampling and getting chocolate into people's mouths because we truly believe that as it melted on their taste buds you know they would they would um, be converted to the product and as I say we ended up with a uh, a telephone directory's worth of press cuttings but I guess the real opportunity for me to weave my values into our business came when we launched Maya Gold and Maya Gold was the very first product to carry the first the UK fair trademark which of course is incredibly widely recognized in its own right now um, but it was not just the first chocolate but the first product of any kind and I think when you can be first with something it gives you the most amazing opportunity for PR and it certainly gave us another huge wave of publicity and some help of the type that I would love to tell any of you that you could write into a marketing plan but basically you couldn't even make it up and it came about for the weirdest of reasons from our point of view which is something we'd never given a thought to which was the link between the church and the developing world and so basically the church became my sales force. And the first I got to hear of this was that um, somebody rang up and said, do you know there's a run for fair trade going on through the streets of Britain? And 20,000 young Methodists have been taking part. And some of them have been carrying a flaming torch in one hand and a bar of your chocolate in the other. And they get to their nearest supermarket and basically lobby the manager to stock the chocolate. I thought, it was someone rang me up with this and I thought it has to be a practical joke and I corroborated it by ringing the press office for the Methodist Church in Lambeth and discovering that actually this had been happening um, but what was even weirder is um, basically the vicars of Britain took it upon themselves to start calling the Tesco buyer who had publicly stated in an interview he wasn't particularly interested in this concept of fair trade, wasn't going to be stocking it in Tesco. And they started calling him to tell him that he had a moral duty to have it on the shelves of Tesco. And the reason I know this is because he called me up one day and said, what's this chocolate that all these vicars keep ringing me about? And honestly, you couldn't even make it up. But it was it was absolutely extraordinary. And then I guess one thing that was really important for us um, because of this link with the developing world was to share the stories of our producers and you know people love stories people as long as they're authentic but they love stories about brands they love stories about places they love stories about people and about community and so one of the key places for us to share that story was I think one day I was doing a chocolate sampling and I realized that there were kind of 12 square inches of white paper on the inside of a wrapper. Why don't we print that with the story of, you know, the chocolate, where it comes from and the difference that that customer makes to the livelihoods and, 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 and well-being of that, of that community by buying that bar of chocolate. And, and it truly does, you know, fair trade totally works. And we have seen with our very own eyes the incredible impact that it's had on the communities that we trade with, particularly um, in Belize, where um, there was no secondary education for the children in the cocoa growing villages when we began trading with the Maya. Now, 90% of those kids go on to secondary school and they bring that the, some of them go to business school and university. And then the skills that they bring back to their communities help the, the the families travel further along the path out of poverty entirely under their own steam so you know that is it's something I'm incredibly proud of and I think that you know it's that combination I guess of kind of magical alchemy of of a superb product twinned with design flair and then underpinned by our strong values which is the real secret of how come you know you can buy our chocolate on a garage forecourt now but I can still be traveling somewhere when I'm allowed. Um, and I can open a mini bar and find a bar of green and blacks in there um, in a hip hotel or something. And um, I never fail to burst into tears. 
And all I can say to you is that it honestly, it is like finding your child in the fridge um, because that it has as much of my DNA as as real children. And in terms of roles, um, Craig was strategy and operations and I took care of all of the outward facing stuff. So the customer service, the branding and design, the PR, the marketing, the sampling with, you know, getting bouts of RSI, breaking up chocolate to give to people in everywhere from supermarkets to green fairs or whatever. Um, and I did all of the high level sales calls as well. Um, it was, uh, you know, there's nothing like sitting in front of a supermarket buyer with your product to bring your story alive for them. And I am not a natural salesperson and it was really hard for me. And I have to say that my my toughest call was to that aforementioned Tesco buyer where I thought as an opening gambit, I might take along a cocoa pod to show him because I wasn't sure he'd ever seen one but something horrible happened. You've got a cocoa pod in front of you. Something horrible happened as I um, got it out of the handbag and it kind of flew apart and hit the Tesco buyer with a shrapnel of cocoa beans. Um, and I have to say that that's probably the only time in the entire history of Green and Blacks when I've actually consumed a hundred gram bar of Green and Blacks in one sitting in the car park as I tried to calm myself down outside Tesco following that appointment. But we used great contemporary design to help us leap out of what could have been an eco niche. You know, it's, it's our original design was, was, was pretty luxurious looking. I mean, it, it wasn't as refined as this, but it, it was, it had gold lettering and it had a ribbon and a seal at a time when, I think, you know, organics had very much uh, an image of kind of earth shoes and lentils and knit your own yogurt. And the single most important lesson that I still say to would be eco entrepreneurs is that you've got to make sure that your product looks and tastes and feels as good as what people are already buying, because they might try it once out of curiosity, but if you disappoint them on any level, um, they won't bite again. And not only that, but you run the risk of actually having turned them off the whole category of, of you know, shopping with values, basically, whether it's organic or fair trade or whatever. So that is the most important thing for me um, is, is to make sure that it's got to be as good as or better than what they're already buying. But I haven't market researched anything I've ever done. Um, Basically, I think that the best place to launch any new product, any new service, any new idea is by putting yourself in your customer's shoes. And basically, that's a way to tap into your own instincts and your own insights, which I think aren't talked enough about in business, um, rather than having to you know, hide behind a focus group or second guess what this kind of mythical customer might want or need. But, you know, we were... We were incredibly successful from day one. It sounds like a fairy story every time I tell it, but actually there were lots of moments of, of gothic nightmare and many, many sleepless nights. Um, we had a political uprising in Togo, which meant that our chocolate was blockaded at the ports. We had to, um, in the end, fly it out, which wasn't very satisfactory for a couple of, you know, eco bunnies like us, um, but that meant it made its manufacturing slot at the factory and then um, made it onto the van that took it to Sainsbury's otherwise we'd have been delisted by our best customer um, and we had hurricanes that actually wiped out a million trees in Belize and we had to work with the Department for International Development to replant um, but they don't come on stream for five years so that was a big blow to both us and the farmers and leaving that aside, it's incredibly difficult to grow a business as fast as we did. We were generally looking at 100% um, a year growth, which sounds fantastic. It's going to make all your friends jealous, but actually um, is also going to have you awake at two o'clock in the morning worrying about cash flow. And so we knew we had to take investment to get it to the next level. And we were courted by a few investors. The guys we decided to go with, um, private equity, 
had previously taken the new Covent Garden Soup Company from 2 million a year to 22 million um, and sold it for 20, uh, 28, I think. Um, and it felt like a good fit. It was a product that um, people were very loyal to, quite widely available, it still felt like Green and Blacks, that it was their kind of personal secret discovery. So we took um, a package of cash and shares, which certainly helped with the sleepless nights. Um, but what was really important to us at that stage was the fact that it came with um, a, an injection of cash to pay for really high level talent. So we got a new CEO, we got a new FD, and we got a new marketing director, the amazing Mark Palmer, um, who, uh, to Craig's and my distress, before we met him, we found out that he came from Burger King, which was rather upsetting to a couple of vegetarians, but he turned out to be absolutely the best person to power the brand onto the next level. And, and then in 2005, uh, five years later, we were acquired by Cadbury's. Um, and I think that my proudest achievement, um, my legacy, if you like, is the way that our values have now rippled up through the organisations which we have become part of. And um, we're incredibly proud of the way that we have managed to influence Cabris in particular, Mondelez as our, as our division of craft has become from within um, and show them that doing good is good for business. And we know we did that with Cabris because there was a dinner for the outgoing CEO of Cabris, um, a sort of funeral for Cabris. It was a very bizarre evening. Um, but he, Todd Stitzer, turned to Craig and I at one point and said, I want to thank Joe Fairley and Craig Sams for showing Cabris the way with fair trade. And that was his acknowledgement that, that literally us showing them that, that doing good was good for business, encouraged them to put the fair trade mark on dairy milk, which of course had a way bigger impact on, on cocoa farmers around the world than little old green and blacks could ever have dreamed of. Um, and, you know, my honest belief is that big companies don't buy small companies to change them. They buy them to learn from them. And we were acquired, well, Cabris was acquired by Kraft, Mondelez as our division became, in, to, in uh, 2011. Um, a reminder that nothing stays the same in business for very long. <laughs> um, but even prouder, uh, Craig and I are of, of the Coco Life project that uh, Mondelez themselves set up in West Africa, which works with uh, 13 different charities on the ground. It's monitored by FLOSA, which is the fair trade governing body. Um, and basically it works in those communities with the charities to find out what those people really need. So in some cases that might be um, a school in a village, in other communities it might be um, water infrastructure that means that kids don't have to walk for six hours a day to get enough water for their families to live, which happens. Um, and what I really really like about it secretly is the fact that uh, you families can't be part of um, Cocoa Life unless women are financially empowered. So it's actually changing um, the whole sort of position of women within those communities. Um, and I'm just really proud of that knock-on effect that we have had, not just on the cocoa industry, but actually, you know, that's rippled out into, into bananas and sugar and all those other things that you can now buy fair trade. But I think what the last couple of years have done for us is, is really made everybody think much more deeply about how we want to spend our money and where we want to put it. You know, um, which brands we want to support, where we want, which organisations we want to be part of, which investment companies we want to invest in. Um, because there's no question that more and more of us are looking for meaning. We're looking for meaning in our life and in our work. And um, what we've seen, if you talk about the corporate angle, um, we've always magnetised talent to Greener Blacks. Um, and it's been shown that uh, having strong environmental and social 
values in a company actually does help to retain um, and attract talent uh, and, and, and engage people better. And actually, I was talking recently to the uh, head of a leading management consultancy, and he told me that um, when he interviews people, they're the ones asking, particularly millennials, they're the ones asking him the difficult questions about whether or not those value, their values chime with their own. Um, and a Forbes magazine study uh, recently showed that, um, that young people will be a, a more 83% more likely to be loyal to a company that helps them to contribute um, environmentally or socially in some way. And I think, you know, customers now expect brands and organizations and investment funds to be on a sustainability journey. Um, but what I do think is that sometimes perfect, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, Organisations are worried that if they're not perfect from day one, then somebody might point out their failings or highlight where they're not uh, perhaps behaving so perfectly. But I truly believe that this is a journey of a thousand miles that begins with a single step. And I don't think that's any reason not to look around and see the difference that you can make in the world um, and then share that with your customers um, and your clients because it's a yeah it's a delicate balance it can be seen as greenwashing and none of us want to be accused of that but um, I think the key is to take stakeholders on the journey with you you know to to really engage with them and and say we're not perfect but we're we're trying and this is how we're trying and I think people are very very understanding of that um, and without being alarmist I honestly believe that we have to do this you know the the last two years have been dominated by a nasty virus and now a war but underneath all of that there is a climate emergency going on which unfortunately gets knocked off the front pages except for a brief moment during COP um, pre-Omicron um, and I was at a soil association panel a few years ago with an amazing Indian environmentalist called Vandana Shiva. And during the Q&A session at the end of the panel, uh, somebody said to her, do you think it's too late to save the planet? And Vandana um, just nodded very sagely and said, the planet will be fine without us. At which point, it's like, oh, okay, that's what we're talking about here. Um, and it, it made me sort of determined, I think, to redouble my efforts on that front. Um, but I, you know, I am speaking to you at a time of, of incredible upheaval and change. Um, but what I've realised in business from my own journey is that there will always be change. There will always be uncertainty. And... Um, nothing stays the same for very long. And for me, a really important way of being able to deal with all of this has been finding a kind of blueprint for wellness that enables me to stay at the top of my game and to withstand the kind of daily stresses that, that life and work throw at me. Um, and I think it's never been more important than ever. Uh, if I look around, I often see that the reason that people throw in the towel on their fledgling careers or their new ventures or, or whatever is quite simply because they're just knackered. And so I think we all have to find a way to, to, to stay strong, to be resilient, um, to deal with the stress, to deal with the long hours and all the uncertainty, etc. So for me, um, it's about getting my 10,000 steps a day. Uh, I never fail to do 10 minutes every morning with my um, calm.com app. Um, I take supplements because I know that I'm not always going to be able to eat healthily when I'm traveling. Um, I do always have green and blacks at four o'clock every day for my antioxidants. Um, but the, this Calm app, I think, is, is something I start every day with, and I don't know how many of you use it, but it just gives me the most amazing clarity to prioritise my tasks and, and, and focus on, on what needs to be done. Um, and I would say that please don't ever think 
it's selfish to take this time to give yourself some TLC. Um, I liken it to that message that you get on, on a plane, which you always really hope you're not going to have to put into action about the oxygen mask. So basically they tell you you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can put it on anybody else. And that for me is a, a, an amazing metaphor for, um, for, for self-care and why we should never feel bad about doing it. But, you know, I've learned all of this as I've gone along. Um, I'm a completely self-taught businesswoman. I left school with six O levels, um, but I have always been hungry to learn because of that and had a lot to prove. Um, and I've read all sorts of business books over the years and many, many different magazine articles about, about business and, and uh, about entrepreneurship. And I try and take away a, a great lesson, a nugget from each one of them. And I have to say that the very best one, the very best lesson I think I ever learned was from Martha Stewart. Now you have to slightly, um, she, obviously she, I think she was the first female self-made billionaire in the States and has a huge homewares and media empire. Um, you have to slightly park the fact that Martha went to jail for insider trading. She does acknowledge this in the very first chapter of this excellent book for women in business called The Martha Rules, which I, which I read and so enjoyed. But basically what she pointed out was that in business, we need two tools. We need a microscope because we're spending all day getting the detail of our business right, as we should. Um, but then we need a telescope because we need to be able to stand back and look at things from afar and see how they can do, how we can do them differently. And I, I think that's what um, events like this, this webinar for St. James's Place do, because they, they I'm sure everyone watching this has, has got 6,387 emails to read and, you know, um, a report to write and bills to pay, et cetera. But I never regretted the time that I took to, to step back and step away from the firefighting and just, um, the refreshed perspective that it gave me on what I had to do. And I think the other amazing thing about um, events like this, even, even online, is that, or especially perhaps now, but a lot of us spend our time feeling like we're little lone salmon swimming upstream. Um, and actually you come together and you realise that, that actually you're part of a shoal and everyone's trying to move in the same direction. And I think that that's just incredibly comforting somehow. Um, but you know, Green and Blacks is still like our first born baby, um, even though we don't own a single share anymore. I am proud to say that I am still a chocolate ambassador for Green and Blacks, which basically means when we're allowed to, we travel for the brand. Um, we've been to the States, Australia, New Zealand, just before lockdown. Um, we've been to all over Scandinavia and, and had many, many different adventures. But I think that the, even more importantly than that, um, what we do for Green and Blacks is we're, we're a sounding board and they know that nobody understands the DNA of, our business, of that business like, like we do. And they listen to us on big decisions, etc. cetera. Um, so that, you know, that to me is incredibly satisfying after all these years. Um, so anyway, before we get on to the bit where uh, someone's going to win some chocolate, thank you all for listening. Um, thank you very much to St. James's Place for inviting me. I'm sure you've had a little glimpse into what an amazing adventure this has been um, to go basically from a, a portobello bedroom to a brand that's worth approaching 100 million um, has changed the lives of thousands of families in the developing world. And I think maybe really did help to change the world one square of chocolate at a time. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. It's interesting that you describe it as from a portobello bedroom onwards. <laughs> I've written down from gin bottles and bricks to finding your child in every fridge. So <laughs> I think there's different ways to describe your, your journey, but each one of them definitely has its merits. Now, I have got a few questions that have come through online as well. So hopefully you don't mind. Um, right. Some of them relate to the business and some of them about you personally. So we'll, we'll try and mix them up and cover off as many as we possibly can. Um, we may not get through everything, but I'll, I'll do my best on this one. So first one, I think it, if we start kind of a little bit about you, Joe, it's a, if you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? And 
why would you say that? Would you do something differently based on that? No, I, I wouldn't do anything differently. And I, I was, I really didn't fit in at school. I went to a very academic school and I was a very creative child. And I always thought it was me. But as I have grown older and wiser, I've actually realized it was them and I've made my peace with that. And I think, um, I think some reassurance that, that I wasn't the, the, the square peg in a round hole that I thought I was, that actually I was just in the wrong hole, um, would, have, would have been really helpful because I, I, I did find it difficult. So if we look at business a little bit now, what would you be your best advice to a one person startup who's in that position now to, to take the business to the next stage? Get a partner. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard to do it all on your own. And I see this all the time because actually um, you need a left brain and a right brain person. And I, I have to be that person for, for my best friend who has a tea business. And, and you know, I, I have to be that kind of sounding board for her and lift her up when she's down. And the great thing about Craig and I was that, you know, if one of us was having a bad day, the other one could put the kettle on and say, it's going to be OK. But also our skill sets were completely different, but kind of overlapped a little bit in the middle. And I think it's very hard to be the person who can write a business plan and write a marketing plan. Um, so it, I have, when I do in real life events, I often have people come up to me and, and the creative ones will say, I, you know, I'd love to have a business, but I literally don't know how to work Excel. And then I will have people quite often accountants come up and say, I'd love to have a business, but I don't have any ideas. And what I would really love is to have some kind of dating service like Tinder for people who wanted to go into business where you match the people with those two different skill sets. So that's my dream. We'll, we'll wait to see people swiping left and right for, for business <laughs> partners next. I think that'll, that'll be an interesting one. Um, so if we come back to you a bit, um, a bit now, Joe, and it's a, a case of, um, you know, as a woman, do you think that's been a, a positive or a negative impact on your journey? And, and what advice would you give kind of women in, in leadership roles right now? Do you think it's any different? Um, I think my, my biggest piece of advice would just be to be yourself, not to feel that you have to be anything other than what you who you really are, warts and all, sense of humour and all, etc. Because when you're playing a role, um, you're always worried about being caught out. It's that imposter syndrome thing, et cetera. And actually, I think the last two years have allowed us to become much more human, much more flawed, much more fallible. And that has got to be a good thing in a corporate point of view, et cetera. So, um, but, you know, I cut my teeth in women's magazines where it was a positive advantage to be a woman. And then by the time I emerged into the corporate world and had my own business, I was kind of, I got quite a lot of, you know, sense of my own power. So I was spoiled by that, I think. But then I, I did write a column for The Telegraph for many years called Wonder Women. And, and I, I became a bit of a kind of suffragette at that point because I realised that that was a pretty unique experience um, for most people. So I've, I've seen it from both sides, but I've been fortunate to be um, cocooned from it because of the career path that I had. Thanks, Joe. I'll give you a nice, easy one now. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll give you this nice, easy one. And I asked you this question before because I was really ah. interested as well. So <laughs> come on, Joe. what's your favourite flavour? So um, it's sea salt because of the amazing kind of alchemy of the salt making the sweetness sweeter and the sweetness making the salt saltier. And um, we used to always just work our way through every bar, um, a couple of bars a week and enjoy every single one and enjoy the discovery of, gosh, the hazelnut and currant really is great. You know, it's unusual to find that with a dark chocolate or whatever. And then we brought out sea salt. And frankly, if there's a bar anywhere within 30 metres, that's the one I go for. <laughs> Thanks for that, Joe. So if we come back to, to business a little bit now, um, um, if we're thinking about sustainability and making profit, how did you balance profit and the sustainability green piece of the business? It just, I mean, I suppose partly that um, 
there is an organic premium and you are people do expect to pay a little bit more for organic but actually what they're paying for is the real cost of that product because with convention for example food produced within conventional agriculture um your the polluter doesn't pay and so at the moment we are all subsidizing um you know the water pollution the the, the you know the carbon uh, waste etc so until there is carbon pricing and to, in in products organic is going to seem more expensive um but ultimately it's it's going to become cheaper because those extra costs of of the damage that that product is doing will be built into more conventional products so um but it did give us a little bit of we we knew we could charge a little bit extra because it was organic and i suppose that helped but you know it was never it was never an issue and i think that the point is that in all business you need to compete on um on quality and on ethics and and not on price because at the end of the day if you try and compete on price you know little are always going to beat you to it basically it's a, it's a hiding to nowhere Thanks, Joe. So if, if we come back a little bit more lighthearted again, I've got a fantastic question that's come through and it's based on one of your slides. Did you ever get a Blue Peter badge? No, <laughs> I never did. Um, to be honest, I never tried, but I loved the programme. I absolutely loved it. And I think I wish there was something like that now for kids, actually, that, that really sought to build children uh, with, with strong values. So we come back to a little bit this one's probably mixed between business and personal because obviously any business journey is is an emotional one as well so how did you balance those kind of up and down moments and how did you get yourself out of those down moments well as i said i had craig and and so we were able to lift each other up when things were well, luckily we were kind of never down at the same time but to be honest the wellness picture that i talked about is incredibly important i think for just giving you that kind of rock solid um grounding that you need when when things get tough uh, or stressful or you you've got too much to do in too little time and unless you have taken care of yourself you know that's when you, people just keel over you know for, for whatever reason so i think i think Putting yourself higher up the priority list is a piece of advice that I would give to absolutely everybody. Okay, so I've got another interesting question that's come through here. I can't resist asking this one. It says, <laughs> can you help me justify my love of dark chocolate by telling me how good green and blacks is for me? Then yes, I can tell my wife. <laughs> absolutely packed with um, with antioxidants. And, and actually, um, funnily enough, we... we <laughs> When we launched uh, Green and Blacks, which was 70% at a time when the highest cocoa concentration on the market was 49%. So we were, you know, a lot of people told us we were mad and the British would never eat chocolate this dark. Um, but we actually had a health warning on the back of the packaging because Craig had to kind of deal with the fact that he was now selling something with sugar in. So it said um, there is ample evidence that suggests that um, sugar is linked with obesity, tooth decay and diabetes so if you want to enjoy chocolate eat choose the chocolate with the highest level of cocoa content and the lowest level of sugar so we actually put that as a health warning on our own product um and i would say to that person you know 70 percent or 85 percent dark chocolate there is so much going for it uh, not least the fact that uh chocolate is the richest source of magnesium on in food and um, women particularly need magnesium when they have PMT. So, you know, there is no better excuse, basically. There we go. We ha everybody has an excuse now to, to eat that chocolate. Um, so another one that's come in, and this um, relates again back to the business. So aside from the fair trade piece, in your view, what can and should companies do to improve their, their credentials in this particular area? I mean, it, a lot of it depends on on what area you're in. Um, but 
but you know there there is there's so much that you can do from a csr point of view there's so much that you can do simply to engage the staff that you have the team that you have with some kind of project that makes that community of, of staff feel like the company that they're working for is doing more than just trying to make money they're actually trying to do something and whether that is kind of i don't know decorating a homeless shelter whether it's some guerrilla gardening whether it's just something they can all do together that is building a set of shared values rather than just um uh you know like paintballing where you've got a shared experience but it's actually not really gonna end up doing much for um the values of the company etc so I, I i mean i think that engaging your staff taking them on a journey of just trying to make a small difference in some way changes the culture of an organization and once you're on that journey other doors will open and they, you will start to think about other things that you can do i can't resist asking this one joe because it's come through on the, on the live q a it says what's been the best piece of financial advice you received oh <laughs> The best piece of, um, I think, I think, um, just don't spend more than you have. <laughs> That's literally, <laughs> um, I'm a kind of mix of a saver and a spender. And I, and I, I do think that money is energy as well. I do think that, um, you have to, I'm, I'm very big on supporting other small businesses, literally through, you know, buying their stuff, etc. Um, and, and so I do think that, you know, rather than just be kind of Uriah Heap and having it all under the mattress, you have to have a certain amount that you just literally circulate in the economy. Um, and so I, I genuinely feel that money has an energy and it mustn't stagnate, but that also that you can use it to, to, to do good. I mean, you know, environmental, social ESG funds, um, are, where everybody should be putting their money i mean it's just it's just that straightforward to me okay so i think we've got time for two more so i'm going to ask ask one now so since starting what's been the biggest challenge to your personal values and how did you deal with it to be perfectly honest i and i'm hand on heart here i have not had a challenge to my personal values in business because because we were fair trade certified and because we were organic, uh, except for a brief foray into non-organic, which is now kind of behind us, but it did have Coco Life certification. So I could kind of live with that because I'm very, very proud of Coco Life. But basically when you've got those two certifying bodies, looking at what you do, making sure that you're doing what you say you do, they create a kind of framework within which you have to behave well. And so it never was, it never was an issue. Um, and also, you know, this is why partly why people buy what we do. So we would be mad to change that. OK, and one last question that I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to call this the, the, the winner uh, of, oh. of the chocolate. And the reason I'm going to call this the winner is because I think this question really says a lot about the answer to this question really says a lot about you personally. <laughs> and I think it's a bit of advice that could possibly resonate with a lot of people as well. And I'm sure there's possibly not just one answer to this as well. If you could recommend one book that's changed your life that you've read, what would it be? Oh, my word, that's such a difficult question. Um, one book that has changed. Do you know, I have just listened on Audible to a really excellent book called Atomic Habits. And it's about um, being more effective, uh, uh, sticking to what, you know, whether whether it's a diet, whether it's a, you know, running program, whatever. And it's a, it, the key piece of bottom line advice in this is not to kind of um, not to have goals, but actually to see yourself as the sort of person who does that sort of thing. So it's it's, it's like... A, you know, I have become a tidier person because of this book, because I say to myself, I am a tidy person, not I must tidy that pile. But it, it, your identity becomes bound up with your habits. And it's a much, much easier way to 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 break a pattern or to adopt a new one. 
And um, I've only just read it, but honestly, it is it is an absolute winner. It's called Atomic Habits. I can't even remember the note. I can look it up on, on Audible, um, which I ha happen to have here. Um, it is uh, James Clear, and it's a Penguin book, and it's called Atomic Habits. It's the best one I've read for years. Brilliant. Thanks, Jo. We might just have time for one last yeah. quick one. We'll get one last quick one in. Um, and we'll end on a light-hearted note. What were the names that um, you and Craig came up with that you didn't use that were really bad? Oh, so, you know, Organichok and Biochok and, and Ecochok, et cetera. And then there was a very funny moment a few years later when we needed, we wanted to launch a kind of snack bar and every name that we came up with was already parked by somebody. It already belonged to Mars or Cabris or whatever. And my great, uh, so we put out a kind of family email saying, have anyone got a good idea for a, a name? And my 90 year old great aunt kept, said, um, why don't you call it the Jojo Bar? Because that's my kind of childhood nickname and um, it's, it's memorable. Um, and I had to buy my name from Count, from Roundtree Macintosh, who it belonged to. And I remember the trademark agent saying, are you absolutely sure that nobody is using Jojo as a trademark? And I, can, I just, can I just tell you that if they were, I would have been given a thousand bars of this over the years. So I can tell you it's not out there. Anyway, we never launched the product. Then Cadbury's bought us. It never happened. And I ended up, I think, selling my name to a company in Germany. So anyway. <laughs> Not everybody can say that they've managed to set sell their own name. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, thank you, Joe. Absolutely brilliant session. Really insightful, really inspirational. Uh, thank you to everybody who's taken the time this afternoon to join us. Um, this session has been recorded, so um, we will be sending out some um, bits and pieces following this. And we'll follow up with the winner of the chocolate, whose name I have written down. Um, so um, we will speak, see everybody very soon and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.